Sergeant, will you please start your recording? PC recording is up. Thank you. Cloud is started. Thank you. Backup is good. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction. At this time, would all panelists please turn on your video? Once again, would all panelists please turn on your video? To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices to vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit any testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We are ready to begin. Good morning, everyone. I am Council Member Diana Ayala, Chair of the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities and Addiction, and I'd like to thank everyone who is joining us today for this remote hearing. This morning, we are holding an oversight hearing on the city's mental health response to community violence and to hear legislation, which I am, a pro I am proud to sponsor, introduction number 1890 in relation to community outreach regarding the availability of mental health counseling in response to violent and traumatic incidents. For too many New Yorkers, Violence and traumatic incidents are familiar, regular occurrences in their lives. These occurrences not only carry physical scars, but also carry invisible lifelong scars and impact the mental, emotional, and behavioral health of those impacted. According to the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, violence causes emotional harm that may result in short and long-term trauma, including depression, anxiety, poor birth outcomes, compromised childhood development, risk of substance and alcohol use disorders, Ne um, negative physical and mental health outcomes and premature deaths. While some victims and survivors of violence appear to develop coping mechanisms or resilience in response to trauma, others develop toxic stress, which over time can actually negatively alter brain development. Violent and traumatic incidents impact all, neighbor all individuals across socioeconomic lines, but disproportionately impact the youngest and the poorest. According to the World WHO organization, 90% of deaths due to violence occur in the poorest communities. Homicide and suicide disproportionately affect young men aged 15 to 44. And for every young person killed by violence, an astonishing 20 to 40 more, um, more will require hospital treatment for injuries sustained in violent altercations. The effect of violence on children and young adults threaten their ability to focus and pay attention in school affect decision-making and learning skills and impact the ability to form healthy and stable relationships. Violence also puts children and young people at a greater risk to suffer from depression, negative and mental health outcomes and increase the potential for drug and alcohol misuse. The COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated so many existing inequalities and problems in New York City and community violence is no exception. This year has seen a rise in gun violence, shootings, homicides and very upsettingly, domestic and intimate by, um, partner violence since March of 2020. This rise in violence can be explained by a multitude of factors, including a global pandemic, economic instability, increase in um, unemployment, increased gun ownership nationally, and significant social and political unrest. We as a city must respond to this, this increase in violence with not only a public safety response, but with a significant mental health response as well. Without a mental health response, we will not be adequately at addressing a real long-term impact of violence on individuals and communities. On a personal note, I am deeply connected to this issue. As a child growing up in New York City, I can recall multiple incidents where I was touched and impacted by violence in my community. I saw things that no child should ever see and didn't have the ability or the knowledge at that age to process that this violence should never be normalized. I carried invisible scars for many years and to this day still occasionally feel impacted by this violence. The idea that New Yorkers still endure this today and may not receive the resources and connections to mental health care that they need to mentally process and emotionally survive violence breaks my heart. I wanna thank the administration, the OHMH, 
Thrive, and the Mayor's Office for Criminal Justice who are here today. I know that you are committed to working on this issue for all New Yorkers and to address the mental health needs that arise when our communities experience violence. I look forward to hearing from you all and to learn more about the role the City Council can play in supporting your efforts. I also want to thank my colleagues as well as my committee staff, Senior Counsel Sarah Liss, Legislative Policy Analyst Chrissy Dwyer, Finance Analyst Lauren Hunt, my Deputy Chief of Staff Michelle Cruz, and Chief of Staff Jose Rodriguez for making this year impossible. I now turn the, uh, to Committee Counsel Sarah Liss to go over some procedural matters. Thank you, Chair Ayala. I am Sara Liss, Counsel to the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction for the New York City Council. I'll be moderating today's hearing. Before we begin, I wanted to go over a few procedural matters. I will be calling on panelists to testify. I wanna remind everyone that you will be on mute until I call on you to testify. You will then be unmuted by the host. Please listen for your name to be called. And for everyone testifying today, please note that there may be a few seconds of delay before you are unmuted and we thank you in advance for your patience. At today's hearing, the first panel will be the administration followed by council member questions and then the public will testify. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. I will now call on members of the administration to respond to the oath. And that order will be Dr. Hillary Cunnins, Executive Deputy Commissioner, Division of Mental Hygiene, New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Jessica Mofield, Executive Director, Mayor's Office to Prevent Gun Violence, Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, Nora Daniel, Director of Intergovernmental Affairs, Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Susan Herman, Director, Mayor's Office of Thrive NYC. I will read the oath and after, I will call on each panelist from the administration individually to respond. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Dr. Cunnins. I do, yes. Thank you. Executive Director Mofield. I do. Thank you. Director Daniel. I do. Thank you. And Director Herman. I do. Thank you very much. Dr. Cunnins, you may begin when you're ready. Thanks so much. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Ayala, members of the committee. Uh, I am Dr. Hillary Cunnins, Executive Deputy Commissioner of the Division of Mental Hygiene at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. As you know, I am joined today by Susan Herman, the Director of the Mayor's Office of Thrive NYC, and Jessica Mofield, Director of the Mayor's Office to Prevent Gun Violence. On behalf of Health Commissioner Dave Chakshi, thank you for the opportunity to testify today about the city's efforts to respond to the health and mental, uh, and mental health consequences of violence and trauma. The de Blasio administration is committed to supporting communities that have experienced violence or other traumatic events. Recognizing that violence and traumatic events can occur in any setting, the administration works across several city agencies and mayoral offices to support individuals and communities in need. Trauma is a response to a highly stressful events that can manifest, as you just heard from Councilmember Ayala, in a wide range of physical and emotional symptoms. The impact of traumatic events like violence affects not just the immediate victim, but can also affect the surrounding community. Trauma can manifest in different ways, including having intense reactions immediately following and up to several months after a traumatic event. For example, people may feel anxious, sad, angry, may have difficulty concentrating and sleeping, and may continue, continually think about the event that occurred. Physical responses to trauma are also common and can surface in the form of headaches, stomach pain, fatigue, increased heart rate, and feelings of easily being startled. Typically, these experiences decrease over time, but can sometimes continue and interfere with a person's daily life. Existing research underscores the importance of providing support to individuals who experience trauma. Trauma that goes unaddressed can increase the risk of mental health and substance use disorders, as well as other chronic diseases. People that experience, people who experience traumatic violent events as children are more likely to receive di a diagnosis of a substance use disorder and or a mental health disorder. 
we know that between 28 and 45 percent of people who were victims of a violent crime manifest symptoms of post-traumatic stress, which include significant mental and physical health consequences. Additionally, events that include violence have a disproportionate impact compared to other traumatic events. Young people of color are more likely to be victims of gun violence and women and members of the LGBTQ community are also disproportionately harmed by gender-based violence. As a result, these groups are more likely to experience the mental health consequences of unhealed trauma. However, with support and proper programming, people in communities can heal, decrease or eliminate symptoms and improve their well-being and function. In low income communities of color and other marginalized communities, trauma is often complex and multifaceted. Evidence shows that violence results from social structures that limit access to basic needs, structures that are fueled by racism, residential segregation, neighborhood disinvestment, and lack of other opportunities. Where these structures persist, people are often exposed to violence and the trauma that results. A trauma-informed response both provides individual and individualized treatment and also addresses social and environmental conditions that cause or can cause re-traumatization. As a public health agency working to become an anti-racist organization, we understand the imperative to resolve these systemic and structural barriers as a means to reduce the effects of trauma. Using a growing body of scientific evidence, we are able to better able to understand what leads to violence and to advocate for and help implement strategies to reduce individuals' exposure. We have seen promising improvements with community-led violence prevention initiatives, which also address the social structures that drive its occurrence. This means that initiatives are designed in collaboration with community stakeholders to meet both short-term acute events and long-term healing. It is especially critical to use this approach because communities disproportionately affected by trauma have often experienced broken promises from the government and other programs seeking to support their communities in times of need. Through community involvement, we need to build trust and provide sustainable solutions. Using this approach, we can prevent violence by addressing poverty, providing jobs, healthier housing, and education. City programs across many agencies and the health department seek to address these root causes of violence and mitigate trauma and its impacts. I will now describe some of these key programs. In 2018, the Office to Prevent Gun, Gun Violence in the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice Law <clears throat> launched the Mobile Trauma Unit MTU program. It has five units, one in each bu uh, borough, sorry. The MTUs provide targeted services and response to communities where violent incidents, incidents occur and connect victims of violence and families to services and resources. These services include public education and outreach on violence prevention and mental health. Each MTU is staffed with a bereavement counselor who is able to connect community members to therapeutic services and also connects trauma and proactive response to community violence. MTUs also offer education and employment services as well as de-escalate and mediate situations that have the potential to become violent. The MTUs are often stationed at community events or activities as well as emotionally charged spaces following violent incidents to mitigate possible conflicts. The MTUs form a vital component of the city's response to community violence, and MOCJ continues to find ways to expand their reach and improve services. In addition to the acute response to gun violence provided by the MTUs, the Mayor's Action Plan for Neighborhood Safety helps to coordinate mental health responses in NYCHA development and works with city partners, such as ourselves at the Health Department, to better connect community members with available mental health services. MAP the, uh, also coordinates broader community building and healing responses to violent incidents within NYCHA development. Next, the Crime Victim Assistant Program, or CVAP, is the cornerstone of NYPD's effort to serve the needs of thousands of New Yorkers who unfortunately find themselves victims of crime. 
NYPD in partnership with the Mayor's Office of Thrive NYC implement CVAP to serve all New Yorkers in precincts and housing police service areas citywide. The program is operated by Safe Horizon, one of the nation's leading victim services organizations. Prior to this administration, victim advocates were available in just three precincts and through district attorney's offices, which only provide support to those victims whose cases are prosecuted. Now, every victim of crime has access to immediate services right in their neighborhood through CVAP. The program embeds mental health support alongside services like safety planning, crime, victim compensation, supportive counseling, connections to individual or group therapy, advocacy for accommodations with employers and landlords and more. This model helps address both the physical and emotional effects of crime, along with the legal and financial challenges that can persist long afterward. Since the program's launch in 2016, more than 174,900 people have received support or services through CVAP. I'll now turn to a number of programs at the health department. At the health department, we work to prevent the health effects of trauma by intervening before or after a moment of crisis to engage individuals and provide support. For example, the department's health engagement and assessment teams provide a health response to people experiencing mental health, substance use, and or co-occurring disorders and health issues. HEAT provides short-term engagement, support, and linkage to services at critical moments in time. Drug overdoses can also be traumatizing events for individuals. Our non-fatal overdose response system called Relay sends peer wellness advocates to provide support, advocacy, and connections to care for people in emergency departments who are recovering from a drug overdose. Peer wellness advocates can help people through a stressful moment in their lives, provide tools and education to build resiliency, and connect individuals to continuing services all to aim to reduce future risk of overdose. NYC Well, for which the health department has oversight and contracting responsibility is a key Thrive NYC initiative. NYC Well, as you know, offers emotional support and connection to care via calls, texts, and chats in more than 200 languages. NYC Well counselors are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week to provide brief counseling and support and service referral for New Yorkers. If necessary, NYC Well can make a referral to a mobile crisis team to intervene with people experiencing or at risk of a mental health crisis. The, Depart the health department also provides services to support communities during and after traumatic events. As part of our COVID-19 response, the mayor's task force on racial inclusion and equity recommended that the health department redirect existing mental health first aid efforts to launch the COVID-19 Community Conversations or 3C program, which provides community training and discussions about the mental health impact of the pandemic, structural racism, coping and resiliency skills, and informs residents of available mental health resources. Soon we plan to launch the second phase of this work, which will be discussion based workshops delivered virtually or in person and include topics that focus on grief, trauma, coping, resilience, and mental health. Our Brooklyn Rapid Assessment and Response Team provides trauma support to communities in Brownsville and Bedford-Stuyvesant, neighborhoods that are disproportionately affected by health inequities that increase their vulnerability to mental health crisis and risk of premature mortality. The program seeks to increase the neighborhood's capacity to plan, prepare and respond to traumatic incidents to mitigate the negative effects of trauma on individuals and communities and increase community resilience. The program provides virtual psychoeducation sessions and training, healing circles and ongoing mental health training and support to local community-based organizations, providers and advocates. Another resource at the health department is our resilience and emotional support team or REST. REST is comprised of qualified trained mental health professionals from the health department who can be mobilized on an ad hoc basis to provide on-site disaster mental health services. REST members can provide information, referrals, something called psychological first aid and crisis counseling to individuals within communities in crisis. 
The programs and its members are only used during local large scale emergencies, such as during coastal storms or currently for the COVID-19 pandemic. For example, early in the COVID response, REST members provided on-site emotional support at quarantine hotels and some testing sites in the Bronx and Brooklyn. I'll now turn to the legislation being heard today, intro 1890. The proposed legislation would require that the NYPD within 24 hours of a determination that a violent or traumatic incident had occurred to notify the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene of such an incident. The bill defines a violent or traumatic incident broadly as meaning an act or series of acts causing serious physical injury or death, including but not limited to gun violence or suicide. The department would be required to conduct outreach to community members affected by any such incident and provide them information regarding available mental health social services and legal services provided by the city and city funded organizations. The administration supports the intent of this legislation. And as you have heard today, we work across city agencies to reach individuals affected by traumatic incidents and provide new services to mitigate trauma's negative effects as well as prevent future trauma. Innovative programming supported by this administration, including the mobile trauma units, the Crime Victims Assistance Program, the Mayor's Action Plan for Neighborhood Safety, NYC Well, and the Brooklyn Rapid Assessment and Response all provide tailored interventions to respond to different aspects of individual and community trauma. The administration looks forward to further discussions with council regarding the scope and agency processes regarding, required by this legislation as well as any potential costs that may come from this bill. We rely on the feedback of our partners in the city council and members of the community like those here today uh, to testify. I wanna thank you council member Ayala, members of the committee for your continued partnership, feedback and support as we continue to care for the health of New Yorkers during this critical time in the city's history. I'm happy to take your questions. Good morning. I wanted to just recognize that we were joined by Council Member Jimmy Van Bramer. I don't believe he's with us anymore, but he was here a little while ago. Um, thank you, um, Dr. Connors. This is a that was a very good testimony. Um, I just I have so many questions, and I just wanted to I guess you know start this um, this hearing with um, we wanted to have this hearing we've been actually we've been having conversations about hosting something like this for some time now and you know i i believe that you know i've had this conversation with um with several of you um about the increase in in violence and specifically in the eighth councilmatic district right but it's not specific to me council member uh alika Amprey samuels you know um can also uh attest to the fact that you know crime has been pretty consistent in in her district as well but having grown up in, in the Lower East Side in the 80s when, you know, uh, gun violence was really rampant, um, I mean, if, if we can believe that it's worse than it is, you know, this year, it really was. Um, and, you know, there were times that as a child, I remember, you know, standing on the sidewalk waiting for a friend to be picked up by the coroner. Um, and this was a common occurrence, right? Uh, thankfully, um, we're not seeing those levels today, but we're seeing in some communities levels that, you know, are still significant and alarming. Um, just the other day, I started to compile a list of shooting. Uh, this is just the shootings. This doesn't have, this not even count, you know, taking into effect, um, you know, intimate uh, violence, uh, nothing else other than just shootings. And I have between July and today about 32. And I believe that it's actually higher than that, but I haven't been able to have the time to sit and go precinct by precinct. Um, so I'm just referring to the one, the, the statistical information that I received from um, the, 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 the PSA, which governs the uh, public housing developments. So, you know, it's, that's, that's pretty significant, right? And that leaves uh, an emotional scar, a deep emotional scar on this community. Um, but that's not even why we wanted to have this hearing. The hearing actually was, um, 
there were a couple of years ago, I uh, was at an event and I had an 11 year old who jumped from the roof at uh, Wagner houses. And I was, uh, I ran over, it was maybe, I don't know, maybe five, six o'clock in the afternoon. It was a beautiful, you know, sunny day, it must have been about almost close to 80 degrees that day. It was uh, not summer yet, but it was a beautiful, beautiful day. And everybody was outside because it was the most beautiful day that week. And when I got there, the, the, the body had been removed, uh, but the evidence of what had occurred was like literally surrounding me. There were children crying, parents crying. Um, the lady that sold water on the sidewalk who knew this little girl was, you know, um, standing there crying. And it occurred to me that, you know, there was no one coming really to help, you know, address this. And just a couple of years before that, it, at the same development, there was uh, an incident where we had a 16 year old that was uh, shot and killed at another development. But the, 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 the young man was, you know, very beloved. And for weeks and weeks and weeks, uh, all of his friends littered the entire front of the, the, the building um, with candles and music and crying. And it was just very evident that there was a lot of emotional uh, distress. And what I've learned you know, in, in, in my old age, is that uh, that emotional trauma eventually, right, you, is that there's, there's stages to grieving and eventually becomes anger and it manifests into something else. And as a result of that, we saw a lot of gun violence that continued that was precipitated by that one incident. Um, in the case of the young, the young girl that jumped from the roof, um, we were able to call the, the administration and um, uh, Thrive dispatched, uh, you know, uh, coordinators to the development. Um, and I went back the next day because I really wanted to see, you know, what the sentiment was. And people were really happy that someone actually bothered to show up, right? And they gave out literature and said, if you're feeling a certain way, if you want to talk about this, if you need to talk to someone, please call this number. And I found that that was really helpful. It really was helpful. The problem was that it wasn't um, an automatic response, right, to what had occurred. It was really as a result of my calling and intervening. Um, at the school level, however, because she went to school a couple of blocks away, um, the school seemed to, pretty, to activate pretty quickly. And so trauma-informed workers were there the next day, um, you know, working with all of the children. But yeah, in the community, there seems to be a disconnect. So I'm not sure because it sounds like there are a multitude of programs that exist, but yet there's a huge disconnect in terms of how those, those programs are dispatched into communities like mine when incidents like the ones that I just described happen. Is that a question? Uh, well, I just wanted to kind of get your thoughts on why you think that is. Yeah, I think um, council member, thanks for your um, description in, uh, you know, of, of these very sad events in your community. And I know that you, um, you know, one of the people that looks for solutions to these sorts of events and through calling us or calling other members of the administration. I think that we do have um, uh, programs, as you've heard, that are designed for um, some, but not every single event. And I think uh, there are areas of real strength, which I, I hope you appreciated hearing about um, for some um, kinds of, of traumatic events, uh, but not every single one. Uh, and so we have tailored responses. Uh, we can mobilize on an ad hoc basis to some of to the some of the events that you describe. Um, and I think that increasingly there is coordination uh, and uh, synchronization across the city agencies as these new programs have developed and been implemented. Um, I mean, but obviously you see the value, right? The value of of mental health workers, you know, being out in the community after an incident, like any of the two that I described. 
I, let, let me say two things to that. Um, first of all, absolutely. Um, I think that and you, we are, as, at the health department and as the administration, are very much interested in embedding um, mental health supports wherever we can. I think I won't answer for Thrive NYC, but uh, I'll let Director Herman weigh in in a moment. Um, that bringing supports to people where they are, whether it's in a community, in a school, is a fundamental tenet of, of Thrive NYC and the administration's approach to mental health. Um, and that's because uh, not everyone cares to seek help. Uh, not everyone is interested in going into a specialty um, healthcare facility. We, that's why we are at aggressively promoting NYC Well uh, and that people can access it, whether it's by phone, text, or chat. So ap I absolutely agree with the, um, how, the importance of what you're describing and, and, the, and the need for us to look for every opportunity where we can integrate. Um, let me, let me uh, see if Director Herman wanted to add to what I've just said about the Thrive approach and some of the coordination role that Thrive plays and it has played and will continue to play. Thank you, Dr. Cunnan. Hello, Chair Ayala. I think you are very familiar with the Thrive approach to embedding mental health services where and when people need it and how they would like to receive services. So as you know, Thrive is not about replacing the mental health system or being the mental health system. It's about filling particular gaps in service with innovative methods. So we are in over 200 high need schools. And when I say we, what I mean is mental health support. We have added mental health support to over 200 high need schools a hundred shelters for families with children, all runaway and homeless youth residences and drop-in centers now have mental health support because of Thrive. We are throughout the city's public hospital system. We are in 42 senior centers. Every precinct and PSA in the city has an advocate to support people harmed by crime violence. And we, as Dr. Cunnan said, very aggressively try and help people understand the value of NYC Well, that you can call, text, or, ch or chat with somebody, a trained counselor, a peer, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And uh, that is our approach. I, we couldn't agree with you more that mental health support is necessary after these traumatic events. We have a great deal of high quality services throughout New York City. And yes, we are still at a point where we cannot respond to every event or, or that everybody doesn't necessarily want to take advantage of everything that we're offering. But we couldn't agree with you more that all of these traumatic events um, require some, some sense of what's available in the city and how people can access support. So would either one of you know, um, does the city currently track the numbers in specific communities where there are higher um, number of, you know, of violent incidents? So Dr. Cunnins, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Well, what I would say is certainly the crime victim assistance advocates are aware of every single crime that occurs in their precincts and PSAs, violent and nonviolent. And so they're aware of the level of those kinds of incidents. It's also true that what Thrive has done is try to locate our services in areas that had had and still have fewer mental health resources than other areas. So 70% of the services that we provide to the city that Thrive has added to what the city already does are in what's called federally designated mental health care shortage areas. So we're going to places where there aren't many resources and trying to add to them. So yes, we track violence. I think Dr. Cunnins would also add that the health department is aware 
and surveys people about the impact, how they're doing emotionally? So if, if, I, if, I, if I wanted to know what are the, the, the five highest need you know, communities in the city today, you would have, one of you would have that access to that information. Depends on how you're defining need. If you're defining need for mental health resources or amount well, of violence in the community. Tell me where the, uh, so for instance, um, the five communities that have, ha that have been impacted by gun violence the most this summer, would you be able to tell me what five communities that, you know, those were? <clears throat> Yes, I, I think that we the police department certainly makes that information public and we're aware of it. And does the police department then share that information ever with uh, with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene or do you have to request it? Well, it's public information. Understood, but I'm saying as a matter of practice, like are, is, are they, because I think that I think that this is the problem, right? And I want you to help kind of and I think this is, you know, and you know, you know me well enough that yes, I, you know, I I have a community, a district that's very difficult because I have, you know, um an oversaturation of of public housing where a lot of, you know, with where, you know, poverty is a is a real thing, right? Where food insecurity uh continues to be a real thing. Um I have you know, a huge opioid crisis, right? That's been consistent. I have gun violence issues. I have a lot, my community suffers from a lot of issues that are not easily remediated overnight. Um, and I can certainly appreciate, you know, the multitude of, you know, programs that exist. However, as a, as a representative for this community, um, I will tell you that I have never, other, other than the exception of maybe the MAP program, which is uh, at Wagner Houses here in East Harlem, um, and the uh, pure violence program, um, I don't, I am not familiar with any of the other response uh, teams. And that's, you know, that's kind of where I get a little bit concerned because I think that there's no, so yes, the police department would know, right, that these things are happening in a specific uh, location, but they're not, they're, they're trained to try to figure out well, who's doing it, right, and then make an arrest. They're not social workers and they're not trained in that way. So they're not necessarily bringing in. In cases of domestic violence, I think that's a little bit different because they, they you know, that's a little bit more sensitive to them. But in cases of like gun violence, it's treated more as a criminal act, right? And the oh, act of, yeah. I, just sorry to interrupt. I was just gonna say it, all of those crimes, not just domestic violence, any, any kind of violence, the victim advocates are aware of that violence and they do direct outreach to the victims of violence, not just domestic violence, any no, kind of violence. I, I, they, no, I'm sure that they do, but, we, but when we see outreach in the community is usually around domestic violence, right? Um, no one is doing, no one is providing any outreach, right? Uh, to the community about the impacts of gun violence um, on a community, right? On a community's mental health, how traumatic that is. Nobody is coming and you know, um, and talking to our young people and saying, you know, like, let's have a conversation about this. This is not normal behavior, right? This is not normal behavior. And if we don't process this, then, you know, we're allowing it to manifest into something else. And it's, you know, so, and, and it happens every single day. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy, but like the mobile response unit, for instance, who dispatches the mobile response unit? I've had 32 shootings this summer, have not seen it once. So, that is a problem, right? How, and I think that is because there's a, it's not because we, we lack the resources, we lack the, uh, the, the connectivity, right? We're not, we're not connecting the dots and we're not talking to each other. It, I think it's probably one of the issues here. Council member, I'm, I'm wondering if we, if I can turn to um, Director Mofield to speak a bit about both, I think the um, data about uh, gun violence as well as the mobile trauma units that uh, Mock J um, does dispatch. And we've been joined by Council Member Cabrera, by the way. You're on mute, Jessica. Could someone help unmute her? Yeah, there you go. You're good. Yeah. Good morning. 
Um, and, and thank you, uh, Council Member Ayala and Chair and the rest of the committee members for your time this morning. I've had a bit of technical difficulties. The host wouldn't let me unmute myself. So I think when it, you know, speaking directly towards, you know, the, the statistics on, you know, the rates or the top 10 leading precincts uh, for gun violence during COVID, I think the unfortunate aspect of that is that it's the usual suspects, right? It's the same communities that we see over and over again mm -hmm. in Brooklyn, in the Bronx, in Queens that just so happen to overlap with the districts. But the way the mobile trauma units um, are dispatched in community is through a partnership with NYPD, where we receive incident notifications uh, from operations. That notification comes to us and then we blast that out to our partners. Um, and what used to be real time, to kind of activate and, and mobilize folks uh, to be able to show up to these incidences. Right now, we have one mobile trauma unit per borough. And of course, um, from what you described, you know, as he was kind of talking about, you know, the 11 year old at Wagner and also, you know, Chico being killed and just the, the overall sentiment of galvanizing and mobilizing individuals from community. It didn't matter if you had a degree. Um, it didn't matter if you were a social worker. It didn't matter if you were a licensed mental health clinician. Any caring, com any caring individual in community, let's reach out and touch our young people was definitely the approach um, that I remember. And I remember uh, witnessing and feeling during that time. And it's very similar to the, the impetus of the mobile trauma unit. You know, we want to be able to show up when these things happen. Um, of course, they don't look like their traditional uh, you know, NYPD mobile trauma units that show up with the lights. The provider for, you know, the Harlem area is um, street corner resources. Um, but a lot of the times it requires folks to come out of the mobile units and engage folks in community. Um, and I just think this past year alone, although, you know, there's been a lockdown with, with COVID-19, we've still been able citywide to deploy the mobile trauma unit over 300 times. Um, and of course, that's still not enough to, to meet the need that we, we see uh, with things being exacerbated um, in traditionally marginalized black and brown communities across the board. So when there needs to be a lever that's pulled or a notification that's received to mobilize people in real time, we are able to share that information with our partners, uh, the way that they show up and hold space in community looks different. Um, and I think it goes back to the point of a trust in systems and individuals um, feeling safe to take up services because that may not always be the case. Um, so it's really, you know, really decolonizing this belief that, you know, mental health services can only be brought on in Western traditions and that there's a way for something organic to happen in community for folks to be able to receive services and to have safe spaces uh, for folks to come to, to talk to and to rely on um, when they're experiencing distress. You know, anytime that there's a shooting that happens in community, it feels like ground zero all over again. And we wanna make sure that we're able to, to show up um, and to, to catch people while they're literally falling in our communities with the grief that they experience. So I hope that provides a little bit of clarity on where to be able to obtain that information. Um, what are the, you know, the precincts that are impacted? Like I said, unfortunately, it's the, it's the top 10 that we always see, the 4042-7573, um, 113, uh, sometimes 114, you know, the, the 70, the 77, the 79. It almost sounds like a numerical song uh, as you kind of go through it. Uh, but it's just really unfortunate that we are, were already experiencing um, the distress of racial inequalities. And then you layer that on top of um, a global health pandemic and, you know, we, we have what we have now. So any, you know, lever that we can pull in supporting the mental well-being, whether it's conducting healing circles, um, deploying our moms and dads team, our gun violence survivors advisory network uh, to kind of make that connection to mental health services feel a little bit more warm um, and not as a, a punitive engagement. Uh, is, is what we, we aim to do by providing those services, not only to show up um, in times of distress, but also to show up as a resource in community when things are going really well. And hopefully we get to a time where things going really well in community is on a continuum. Um, thank you, Jessica. We've also been joined by Councilmember Morali. 
Um, but but the question is, so who who decides when the mobile unit is dispatched? So every the community does essentially once an incident happens, uh, the team, whether it be the GOSO team or the street corner resource team is deployed to show up to that incident. Um, and we try to be uh, very careful about how we engage the individuals on the ground, one, to ensure that we're not, you know, impeding on any investigations, but also to make sure that, you know, we're supporting individuals, not only in accessing resources, but also to ensure that retaliation doesn't happen. In Harlem, we also have the hospital responder program. So anytime that there's an assault, uh, there's a stabbing, there's a gunshot victim, a team is deployed and is notified by the hospital and that will be Harlem Hospital essentially um, to come to be able to mitigate violence from happening um, in that hour and understanding that emotions are very high, whether it's in the hospital or out in community to make sure that folks are supported to prevent retaliation, retaliation excuse me, but also to um, provide resources to folks. So as soon as there's a notification, uh, our partners are automatically mobilized. And if we don't hear any movement, um, our office plays an essential role in making sure that that, that mobilization does occur. Um, but normally, you know, the coalition that you have in, in East Harlem and also, you know, in the 4-0 is very, very strong that they normally don't need any um, additional interventions to show up and hold space for folks when they've been impacted. I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, I mean, I, I, I agree. We have a lot of really fantastic organizations out on the ground um, that have been very helpful um, during traumatic, uh, you know, experiences. But in, in East Harlem alone, I have um 13 developments 13 you know public housing developments and and 10 of those are non-senior you know um cure violence is uh, offering services to the northern part of of the right. district which means that the uh southern part of the district and east harlem alone right. doesn't get doesn't it doesn't have access to those services right so something has to happen so maybe, you know, something happened and I, you know, heard about it, or maybe one of the GOSO team members, you know, has a, a close relationship with someone over there and they'll, they'll, you know, they'll dispatch, but they don't have to, right? There's not, there's no mandate that they be there, right? And we had, for instance, summer, we had a march. Um, I don't know if you were there, but were you, did you march with us? It you said that came through. I yeah, we had a march with you guys. <laughs> we, had, we, had the, we had the peace march, and the night before the peace march, there was a shooting at right. development where we actually were convening, and none of us were aware because it had just happened a few hours, uh, I, I think, in the middle of the... Uh, it was actually at 11 o'clock that eight, the night before, right? So when we showed up, um, we didn't realize that there had been a shooting the night before. No one had told us, and you know, the, the kids and that development were like really um, upset with us because they felt like we did not acknowledge that this had just happened to them. And here we are marching through the streets of East Harlem and we, not, we never acknowledged them or the fact that this had occurred to them. So then we had to come back, you know, and it was very difficult because by then they were very, you know, they were very resentful. Um, and I remember just a couple of, the, you know, so, and no one ever, and no one came, by the way, no one else came after that other than NYPD and they didn't want to see NYPD. Right. Right. And so, and, and that's, and that's what I mean is like, we have, there are, we, we have, we're very lucky in that we have a lot of great community partners. We are very fortunate in that we have programs that are funded to do this work. What we don't have is a coordinated effort to ensure that when X happens, Z follows. That's where we have. And I, and I, and I'm, and I, again, I don't want to make this about my district because this is not my district. It just, unfortunately, it just so happens that one, that my district is one of those districts where, you know, this type of violence continues to happen. And I don't want to, I'm not going to blame or assume, you know, I'm not going to say that it was COVID related because it isn't COVID related. It has been right. consistent high for the time, my, my entire time in office, right? And this happened after Chico, because again, we never really dealt with the um, aftermath of Chico in a non-police way. And mm -hmm. so even if you go to YouTube today, and I welcome any of you to do that, you can 
So you can Google um, Chico um, at Wagner Houses and you will see video after video of these young people, some as young as 11 and 12 years old, who are obviously in a lot of emotional distress and the approach to really addressing it was to police our way out of it, mm-hmm. right? The police was called because they were obstructing the front of the building. The police was called because they were playing loud music. They were actually trying to record videos. And I'm not, you know, saying that this is, you know, the correct way to mourn anybody or not. I, you know, I, I'm just sharing with you what what occurred. You know, they were trying to, you know, in in their in their grief, they were trying to record these videos, and so the police was called and you know, um, on multiple occasions. And it became um, really hectic because again, they're not, they're not social workers and they are, they shouldn't be there. We shouldn't be using them in that way. I think this is a disservice to them and it's a disservice to the community, especially when we have, um, when we have access to all of these other um, resources. In the case of the Washington houses, right? We go to March, we don't acknowledge. And then a couple of days later, I, you know, I, I, I am at the wake and I, when I tell you that every seat was occupied by a young person mm-hmm. that was inconsolable, every seat was full of a young person that, you know, and you know who was there responding? The police. The police. I had police on one side of the co- of the street. I had police on the other side of the street to make sure that nobody came in and brought in any additional violence to the community, you know, to, to, to them while they were there. But no one else was there. And Cure violence doesn't cover that catchment area. So they never, you know, they never made it over there. And those kids never received those services. And that's and that's what I mean is that if we intend to really change, right? And effectuate some change that is long term, that sticks in communities like ours, that we have to be a little bit more strategic about what those services look like, who's rendering them, what is the automatic response, right? If you have an 11 year old that jumps off a roof automatically somebody should be saying, Jesus, this is horrible, right? Children witness this. Somebody should pick up the phone. Now, who that somebody is, I'm not sure. Is it the police department that then contacts the Department of Health and the Department of Health automatically just, you know, contacts Thrive? I don't know. Do they automatically contact Thrive and say, hey, you know, we need to dispatch, you know, workers um, to the specific location, but there has to be some sort of, you know, of, Man- mandatory requirement that X, Y, and Z occur because other than that, we're leaving it at the discretion of a person that is then making a personal uh, decision as to whether or not this particular incident merits this you know, this kind of response. Am I am I making sense? You're making perfect sense. You know, I definitely you know understand the the limitations, right? Of having, you know, a program that's focused on like the propensity of one area and the surrounding community um, not feeling the same type of love. But I do feel like this conversation is the beginning of many to kind of um, hotwire, if you will, what the connective, you know, protocol would be for other areas um, that that aren't as resource rich, if, if I can say, in this aspect where you have something that happens at Washington houses, you have like the the, the heart and grief um, and confusion of young people who are trying to process a new normal without their loved ones and then what do they do, right? You know, again, memorializing and lighting candles is definitely a part of our process, but that's not enough for our young people. So I do think that, you know, this is the time for us to be extremely innovative and in incubating what we want to see, whether it's, you know, what you described, which could very well be a protocol within itself, right? Incident happens, the notification goes to the local, you know, neighborhood action center that's in East Harlem. They mobilize the heat team or thrive, and then they go out to engage, um, whether it be the parents or the young people that are open at this point and trusting of taking up those services. So I'm down for whatever it takes to, to start having real healing in community um, because right now it's only happening in a vacuum. And I think it's okay for young people to know that vulnerability um, and sharing that doesn't make them weak. It's actually a strength for them to be able to, be, to process their emotions in real time in a real way that honors the person that they lost. So whatever you need from us, we're down. Yeah. Now it looks like it looks like a system like that exists when it pertains to the schools, right? Because I don't, I don't, I'm not sure. Could, could one of you explain to me what that? Because it, it seemed like the responses in the schools is pretty immediate, and I'm not sure if that's triggered by a conversation with NYPD. If you know, I I don't know how that happens. 
I don't know enough about that process, but I'll turn it over to the Department of Health to kind of share what that looks like. Yeah, let me let me just jump in and then I'm going to turn it over to um, Director Herman for um, who can provide some answers. Just just to say, um, I think what we're discussing is the need for connections amongst programs and the need for um, some uh, improved processes, as well as um, I'm glad and it was great to hear from Director Mofield about the extent to which there is uh, resources and approaches that perhaps need to be um, made more for, for you yourself, council member, but other colleagues to be made more aware of, of, of distributing when, when there are resources for, for which we do have very built out responses. And Director Herman for schools. And then I'll, I'll add on, I think, to the end of what you say as well. I think um, what you're referring to, Chair Ayala, is that when there is an incident that either involves the school and the school environment itself, or something happens that involves a student that police are aware of, the police in both cases are notifying the Department of Education and they are sending out the appropriate response, whether it's a school response clinician who gets to that school within 24 hours um, during COVID virtually, but otherwise in person and works with that student and other students who have been impacted by whatever that incident is, or it's the school-based clinicians, if they can handle it, the people who are there all the time, the school clinics, but there absolutely is a standardized notification process between the NYPD and the Department of Education so that the schools and the students are getting a response very quickly. We've also, as, as you know, we've also just converted the school-based consultants who were not doing direct service, but we're developing mental health plans and providing technical assistance and training into mental health specialists. They were consultants, they're now specialists who will be providing groups in schools that need it. Um, starting first in the 27 communities hardest hit by COVID, but that will be more of an ongoing group work to help those students process what's going on in their lives, the grief and the loss and also traumatic events that occur. Those groups will be happening in schools throughout those 27 communities that often mirror the communities that Director Mofield was talking about. It's the same communities. And how, so how, uh, how, how, how does that work? Um, so does that, is that, um, first of all, is it virtual? I'm assuming that some, some component of that will be virtual. Yes, right now it is virtual, but we hope that it will become in person and that every one of those. So we have school response clinicians that, that respond to schools all over the city when there's a crisis that occurs that involves students. And they respond by doing immediate crisis intervention and de-escalation. And they also provide short-term treatment if it's necessary until students are connected to ongoing care if they need that. And is, is, that via, is that via a clinician or is that via like a community-based um, organization that provides? Because I know that in the case of the, uh, the, young, the young girl that, um, that committed suicide, ABC, which is a nonprofit in, um, in Councilmember Perkins District that provides mental health services for young children was the, the organization that provided those services at that school. So, does the school have a separate contract or is that through Thrive? So there are school response clinicians that Thrive supports. Those are Department of Education employees. And they are social workers who are responding to these schools and providing services. One of the things that they do besides the immediate crisis intervention is try and connect students who need care to appropriate resources. And sometimes that's a local nonprofit. Sometimes that's a health and hospitals clinic. Sometimes it's a community-based mental health provider or clinic. 
So that's part of their responsibility is to connect those students to care. The other program that I was talking about, these are Department of Health employees who are providing group counseling or group work in schools starting this, you know, this month really um, throughout the 27 communities hardest hit by COVID. So each one of them will work with up to five schools and students who will be identified by teachers or parents or guidance counselors will be referring students to these specialists for group work. So some of the programs in the schools are run by the Department of Education, some are run by the health department, but they coordinate beautifully through the Office of School Health. And I'll, I'll just add to that um, description is that the way the health department can support this is in two ways. Um, one is um, there are children's uh, mobile, what are called crisis teams that can be, um, that are deployed by NYC well, but those schools could, um, schools can make use of that service. Um, and in the occasion of ABC or other instances, we work very closely with Office of School Health, with DOE, with Thrive to, um, in this sort of case, find a mental health provider who has the potential to deliver services or supports off site, meaning off their usual site of care. Mm -hmm. um, and so in that way, we are coordinating from the health department point of view to be sort of an extension or try to link to extended services where what is in place is insufficient. Hmm. Yeah, it seems to me like it works, it works uh, a lot smoother in the school system um, than it does in, you know, outside in the community. We have, I think, you know, again, it's just a, it's just a matter of the, not of the consistency and the connectivity. So does that, does any, does the Department of Health um, or, or Thrive work with NYCHA in any capacity as, as it relates to violence at the developments? Uh, so we, um, I'll, I'll, I'll kick us off. I think probably all the agency, all the agencies represented here do plus others. We do work with NYCHA in, in our neighborhoods. Um, Director Mofield mentioned our neighborhood action centers. We collaborate there. We, um, in um, the Brooklyn uh, team that I mentioned, RAR team uh, in, um, Brownsville and, and Bedford-Stuyvesant work uh, there with NYCHA developments and we have certainly been called in um, uh, on an ad hoc basis when we are notified for asking for assistance to arrange assistance and support as well. There are oh, other... No, no, I just wanted to just a point of clarification. When, when you say with, um, with NYCHA, is it with the NYCHA Resident Association leadership? Is it with the local community center? um director is it with NYCHA it's you know with uh you know with the chair of NYCHA the vice so, president so we've we work at different levels we definitely work sort of at this sort of central level as well as um when the tenants uh organization in some cases we have very strong relationships in particular areas of the city uh or the community center so there is some variation in the individual uh, housing area or neighborhood. Um, so we also wanna build community relationships. And so we wanna make those relationships and depending on what resources or programs are available in the particular area, we wanna make uh, those connections and offer services. We, uh, for example, in cases where there has been somebody who lost uh, their life to overdose, or uh, we have brought in um, education and information and the lock zone as a way to help communities um, gain resilience, uh, get informed, connect people to care when people are mourning, um, uh, to connect them with mental health supports as well. We have similarly uh, done similar work around high impact profile suicides, as you, as you mentioned, Council Member Ayala, 
where we have been able to, on an ad hoc basis, um, send out um, either crisis supports, uh, connect with information. I'm wondering if either Director Herman or Mofield have, have other NYCHA information. I mean, I, I, uh, I think that because I've had this conversation with NYCHA um, and you know, they, you know, their feeling is, and, you know, many years ago, there used to be a social services, you know, uh, division that, you know, worked with residents who were experiencing difficulties, uh, you know, um, and it, that doesn't seem to really happen anymore. I think that NYCHA has taken a position where they're kind of landlord and they um, defer to the NYPD on cases of like gun violence, for instance. Um, I, I think that there's a, that is a missed opportunity because I think that you know, obviously there's a, you know, there's a lot more, right, that comes with gun violence um, that isn't addressed. And I think that, you know, it's a missed opportunity for NYCHA to not um, engage their residents differently. Um, and I, you know, I, I always, I live across the street. I'm actually sandwiched in between two public housing developments. And I tell people that in, in my building, right, um, we don't really see, and I live in a regular in a regular tenement building. Um, we don't really see that that type of, you know, of of, of activity. Um, true, we don't have the same level of density. However, there's also the added benefit of having a, a landlord that is pretty actively involved in what's happening in and around the building and how whatever it is is happening in and around the building affects the quality of life of the other residents. And so if, if there is an issue that is becoming problematic, that resident will receive a letter stating you need to come into the office and we need to have a conversation about this. And the issue is addressed that way. Um, in, 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 at NYCHA, that very rarely is the case. So we had a couple of summers ago, I was at home and because I'm sandwiched between Wagner and Jefferson, I uh, get it an alert from, um, one of uh, what do, what do you call this uh that app where you get all of the um citizens app that there's a fight just down the block and so i you know i go to it and you, people can upload a video you know real live a live video there must have been like 50 60 kids is beating each other up um one kid happened to be walking outside of the building at the moment that this is happening and he gets clobbered over the head with a metal pipe he had nothing to do with what happened. No one was intending, you know, no one was looking for him. He just so happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And so we have a conversation afterwards. And I said, well, you know, what is, where's the level of accountability? Like, how are we, how are we, you know, working to address these issues? Because these are, this is not an issue that another development came. No, no, no. These are the kids in the same development fighting the kids, you know, their, the, their neighbors. And he said, well, that's not our issue. That's a, that's a police matter. And I said, well, I'm sure that you, you know, I mean, there were, th this child was like seriously injured. And they're like, yeah, well, it becomes a police matter. And I'm like, well, do you at any point have any interaction with the residents, you know, if they come in contact with the police department? No, it's a police matter. Um, and so I, it looks to me because I have, you know, I remember when I used to live in Lillian Ward houses and we had the community policing program in the actual development um, but we also had different relationships with management that, you know, NYCHA's position has been to kind of move away from a lot of these issues. And I think, again, is a missed opportunity. So MAP, for instance, right, the mayor's action plan is that Wagner houses, they kind of pick up a lot of that. But MAP is only, you know, available in specific developments, right? And here I'm telling you, I have 32 shootings. Those 32 shootings happen throughout the perimeter of 10 developments. So MAP is not assigned to all 10, they're only assigned to the one. So those other nine you know, developments don't receive that same level of service. Um, so there's a connectivity, serious connectivity issue. Um, I'm wondering if um, Director Mofield might wanna comment a little bit more on, the, on that, what is and isn't available in, in, for, for non-covered developments. She's on mute. Sorry.
just bear with us a moment while we work to meet her. Thank you. <laughs> You know, I, I agree, you know, Council Member Ayala, you know, the, the strength of the social service unit that used to be a part of um, supporting families. I do believe that there, there still is um, a unit in NYCHA that does provide, you know, social service supports to family, but I can't speak on the, the intimacy of what, you know, all that it provides. Uh, what I can say is, um, there is, there does need to be better connectivity to the resources that are in community because, you know, sometimes there's the power in knowing that it already exists. There's also, you know, power in knowing that these services are available to individuals in community, not only within NYCHA, but in the neighboring, you know, um, buildings uh, that surround the community. So I know, you know, in speaking specifically to, to our programming uh, with the New York City Crisis Management System, we do work with Union Settlement um, and the folks at GOSO, you know, in the Jefferson Johnson houses. And when there are things that arise, um, there are like, you know, these kind of East Harlem coalitions that kind of come together to support these things. But I do think that, you know, access to services, leveraging services, making services known to community, and then also addressing language barriers that may exist um, is something that we can always work on and get better at as not only as an office, but a city. But I can't speak to the specificity of how NYCHA responds and or is notified um, to other incidents that happen out of our programmatic purview. But are you familiar, are you aware of any programs that work directly with NYCHA to address some of these issues? No, right? No, I'm I not able to speak to that. Yeah, I don't, okay. I don't know. I, I was hoping that maybe through um, the Department of Health. Because, um, I think, I think, I really do think that there has to be, because again, you know, um, as, uh, as Director uh, Mofield, you know, referenced earlier, there are, you know, like these are, there's just a handful, well, maybe a couple of hands full of, of communities where you know uh, where this happens, right, and where we have the highest crime rates. So I think that you know really bringing everybody, all of the stakeholders to the table to come up with you know a plan that you know truly addresses and 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 provides the wraparound services that are needed to to address. Like for instance, if I walk into the community center and we have a cornerstone program and a, a cornerstone program that is very successful in bringing in the young people that would normally not go into into a you know into a community center to receive services you go in there and there's not a lot that's happening right there aren't social workers there there aren't trained you know mental health uh, providers on site um, there there should be you know a way to infuse those programs and services with you know uh, the professional skill set that they need to really address a lot of the the root cause you know is you know uh, issues that contribute to the gun violence. Um, you know, food insecurity is really big among our young people. Okay. Uh, a lot of our teens are sleeping in the hallways, right? Because they have been, you know, they're borderline homeless, right? Um, they're having issues at home and their parents won't let them in or they can't let them in in some cases because they've been permanently excluded from their, you know, their place of, of, of housing. And um, these are, you know, real issues that we're not necessarily addressing. And so, um, thank you, though. Thank you for that information. Um, may, and maybe you may also be the person to respond to this question because it really is, is in regards to the health and hospitals connection. So in, in the event that a person doesn't end up like in a Harlem hospital, they end up, uh, you know, or they do end up in Harlem hospital. Does the hospital then connect them to the mental health resources that they need? So specifically for the crisis management system, when uh, an individual, you know, shot, stabbed, you know, um, or assaulted, the hospital responder team at Street Corner Resources is activated, they come. A part of our network of services is being able to provide community healing and wellness services, and that's connecting them with the clinician that they have in-house. Um, and if there is, you know, a higher service provision that's needed by the individual, the family, et cetera, that person is, you know, or that family is then referred out, you know, for continuity of care. Um, 
at the hospital. So we're in four hospitals across the city, even though we're speaking specifically to your district. It's Rumsey, you know, University of Richmond, Staten Island Hospital, Lincoln Hospital in the Bronx, Harlem Hospital in, in Kings County, um, and Light Touch Points uh, at Brookdale. So there is a connection not only to, you know, the program and the violence interrupters and outreach workers that we have on the ground, there's also a connection to um, a mental health condition that's on staff through the provider um, that provides that service. Is that by request or is that automatic? Like, so that we, oh. it's, it, that happens automatically, but in terms of the uptake of, you know, counseling sessions, that really depends on the individual's willingness to participate in it. But, you know, once you have a connection to, you know, the outreach work or violence interrupting on the ground, whether they realize it or not, it's still a therapeutic relationship that's being built out. Mm -hmm. um, and, if, and if I could um, go back to uh, the, the point of, um, it escapes me, it'll come back to me. Okay. Uh, Director Herman, I saw you motioning earlier. Did you want to add? We're sort of we're we're off the point at this point. I just wanted to comment, uh, Councilmember Ayala, that there are clinicians in all of the runaway and and homeless youth drop-in centers and residences, um, and have been now for a while. And young people who are in those drop-in centers or in those residences are screened for mental health needs. They're referred to services if necessary, and we track. It is a rather transient population, but we track whether they made their first appointment, and we know that we're very successful in having that happen. So the at least the some of the young people that you're describing are being connected to care through the centers that you were describing. I think, yeah, I, th I think, yeah, I, and I and I appreciate that because I think that those programs actually have um, a great uh, retention rate. And um, I think my concern is really for those young people who are still, you know, we consider disconnected that wouldn't go into like a community center that wouldn't, yeah. um, that are coming into contact with maybe law enforcement or a medical provider or a school, you know, um, you know, an educator, a uh, principal. Um, yeah. Again, in the school setting, it seems to work really nicely. There's a flow, right? That's pretty consistent. But yet, when you remove it from outside of the boundaries of the school, that consistency doesn't exist, right? It's, it's almost like it depends on who you know, right? And what the circumstances are, you know, specifically specifically tied to that incident. Um, and and that's kind of so. The so really the intent of the of the bill of the legislation was that whenever a shooting occurred, it would trigger an automatic response and a mobile outreach team would be out there immediately the next day, right? So the police would do what they have to do because the police is gonna do what they have to do. And, you know, we, we're not, you know, we're not gonna discuss that, but um, who we needed some, uh, like a trauma-informed team that, you know, in, especially in communities where cure violence doesn't exist because cure violence is a great model, but quite frankly, cure violence was intended to, uh, you know, to really address the um, the gun violence itself, mm -hmm. not the mental health, right? They're not the trauma that's left behind. And I'll tell you that I'm 47 years old, and I and when I when and I and I, I mentioned this in my opening remarks, like I I never I I remember I remember very vividly, and I was sharing the story as we were prepping for this hearing. I'm um, being five years old, living in the Lower East Side, and I remember hearing shots outside of the window, and everybody ran to the window, and then. Eventually, you know, they, they, the, the, the adults kind of got distracted and the children were looking outside of the window. And I remember looking outside and seeing this gentleman, you know, in a, in, in a, in a chair being, you know, brought into the ambulance and like being covered, his head being covered. And I remember bullet holes that may or may not have been there, but that's the way that I remember it. I was five years old, right? Um, I remember that being followed by you know, just a, a, a few months later, in the, in the middle of the winter, there was a woman that was found murdered just down the block from our building. And we, we happened to be outside playing and everybody's trying to, you know, running over there to see what's going on. And we, you know, out of curiosity, run over there and there's this woman there in, in full rigor mortis, you know, mm -hmm. naked, uh, you know, deceased and, and, and right in front of us. I mean, 
these, these are things that don't necessarily happen. I mean, crime happens, right? But they don't happen in, in, in the way that they occur um, in communities like mine as often. And it, it, we have somehow, you know, in, in normalized it, right? So it's like, oh, wow, that's horrible. And then we move on and it's like, you know, we, we push it aside. But you can only push it aside for, you know, for so long before it finally blows. And I find myself, even at 47 years old, sometimes in meetings and in hearings like these, and I'm sitting and I'm talking about these things and I am triggered, right? To the point that I am bawling and I don't know why I'm crying because I'm like, it happened such a long time ago, but I never processed it. I never went home. My, my parents didn't have the foresight or the experience, right? To, to deal with these issues either because they dealt with their own trauma and they were also trying to kind of get by. And it's like, oh, wow, that's really, that's horrible that, you know, Joey was shot in the head on, you know, on 4th Street and Avenue. That's horrible, right? Um, I, I remember being nine years old and walking with my cousin and we were actually skipping home. And I remember hearing shots and we stopped because we heard the shots and we knew at nine years old that those were gunshots. And we ran, right, to safety only to learn you know, a little later that it was her brother who had been shot and killed at, you know, behind the schoolyard at a party. And these are, you know, events that, you know, again, I was nine years old, I'm 47, continue to happen in my community every single day. Just yesterday, I had, I had a shooting yesterday, I had a shooting on Saturday. I mean, it's consistent, it's consistent, consistent, consistent. And so I think that the reason that is that consistent is also because, you know, in part, we are not really addressing you know, what is contributing to it. And I think one of the things, and there are many, and a lot of those things don't have anything to do with the Department of Health or Thrive. Um, but I think that there's an opportunity for us to really think through, well, what is it, right? We have five communities that, you know, are, you know, the most seriously in need right now for this type, this level of, of, of coordination. Then let's figure out strategically what does that look like. Let's pilot it in two districts, right? Let's see what what it looks like. Let's ensure that you know that that that, that process exists so that we're really uh, addressing the root cause of of gun violence in communities like mine. That we're really addressing the impact of domestic violence on the young people and the you know the witnesses um, of of domestic violence that you know we're really um being thoughtful and not just checking off a box that somebody showed up but they never connected anyone to the next person and called it a day mm -hmm. and so that's that's my concern and that's really my intent behind this piece of legislation is to ensure that that automatically is triggered with or without my having to necess necessarily pick up the phone and call someone to make it happen. And I don't want there to be an assumption that it does happen because it, it doesn't, it, it really does not. Um, and I speak from experience. I've been on this, I've been, in, you know, I've worked here. I worked with my predecessor for many years and, um, you know, thankfully, uh, you know, back when, when I started working here, gun violence was not as uh, prevalent here um, as it has been in the last few years. Uh, but I've been around long enough. We, you know, help facilitate peace marches and gun violence awareness events. And we work with uh, the Thrive Collective, which is really, you know, an awesome organization as well. They do um, trauma-informed art around gun violence, right? Which is a very clever, I think, way of really speaking to young people um, about the effects of it. And last summer we had something like that. We had an intern um, and we decided to go into the public housing developments where the gun violence was more um, prominent. And we, we said, well, let's do an, you know, an art event and, and uh, it was open mic and the littlest, you know, kids would come up, I mean, five, six years old to talk about their experiences with gun violence. Um, and I don't think that any, you know, I don't think that many people can say that that's been their experience, right? Mm -hmm. that, that, that they've had to sit in a room of, of little children who can articulate, right, what this means to them and how, um, how they know someone who has been impacted by gun violence in this way. And so I, my, my whole, um, my purpose is really to help do my little bit and um, 
in ensuring that we're not continuing to normalize this and that um, because whether we intend to do that or not, that's what happens. When we don't really address it, then we're contributing to that. And I consider myself, you know, um, culpable as well. And I, you know, so I want to do my part to really make sure that, you know, um, this is, you know, that, that we're, we're all talking to each other. Um, and if we do that via legislation, we're, you know, we're ensuring that legally we're required to do that. And that's probably the best way to do that. Um, because I, you know, we all move and we all change roles and um, we, you can't really anticipate what the next person will do. I'm not sure if there's any council member that has any question. Um, I didn't see any, so I didn't. Council yeah, member. We'll give, we'll give a moment uh, for any council member with a question to use the Zoom raise hand fun function, but otherwise, um, Chair Ayala, do you have any further closing remarks? Uh, no, I want, I want to just say, Thank you. Um, you've given me a lot to think of. I, you know, really uh, would appreciate any feedback, any additional feedback uh, to to the legislation. Because again, um, it's really intended to really connect all of the dots, and um, and 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 it looks like there are a lot of dots to be connected, right? It looks like what our problem is not a problem of having the resources. We have them; they exist. So how do we utilize them in the in the smartest way? Um, possible, but I want to thank you all because I know that you know you, you guys work really hard, and especially under the circumstances where we're even you know that much more uh, stretched. Um, I, I appreciate you coming in to testify today. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. That concludes the administration's testimony. Uh, we will now turn to public testimony. All public testimony will be limited to three minutes. After I call your name, please wait a brief moment for the host to unmute you and for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. The first panel that we'll have today is Theoda O'Grady from the Samaritans of New York, Erica Sandoval from the Presidents of NASW NYC, and Joyce Kendrick, Brooklyn Defender Services. So the first to testify would be Fiota. And when you're unmuted, Fiota, you may begin once the sergeant cues your name. Thank you. Thank you. Your time starts now. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Fiona O'Grady. And on behalf of the Samaritans of New York's Suicide Prevention Center, I want to thank Chair Ayala and all the members of the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities and Addictions for the opportunity to speak with you in regards to the city's mental health response to community violence. As a member of the international organization that created the world's first suicide hotline in 1952, as well as the New York City community-based organization that's operated the city's 24-hour suicide hotline for over 35 years with ongoing support with, from, from the city council, uh, Samaritans have spent a lot of time learning the keys to helping people in distress. The proposed legislation, Intro 1890, requiring the NYPD to notify DOHMH of individuals who are experiencing problems tied to their mental health within 24 hours is a sound step in enhancing crisis responses to those who are potentially suicidal. But Samaritans would respectively also suggest that those who will implement this legislation consider the research that demonstrates that the more points of access those at risk have in seeking care, support and treatment, the more likely they are to use them. The fact is that the majority of people do not actually utilize the referrals they are given, often because they did not select them or they did not reflect their own social and cultural inclinations. If we've learned anything at the Samaritans in our almost 70 years of operating crisis response services in 42 countries, it is that no matter how well intended or no matter how much evidence-based research goes into program development, people experiencing crisis must feel comfortable with the options presented to them. And I think a lot of you, a lot of the discussion earlier has been around a little bit around those issues too. And that means having choices they can relate to. Therefore, we would suggest that the resources provided as a result of this legislation not be limited to the usual network of city approved providers, but be more expansive. There are countless quality community-based organizations that have provided effective, um, effective pro 
have proved effective over the years in serving those most impacted by stigma, use them. And I think Director Jessica Mofield alluded to the sort of any lever we can pull to connect and have these warm supports is a good one. Diverse cultures require diverse choices, whether alternative forms of care, holistic, volunteer driven, faith and spiritual based. There are so many people doing good work in the city, their abilities and talents should be better utilized. For the primary goal is to get that person connected to someone, someone they can trust and relate to who makes them feel safe and secure. This will open door to further forms of care, but you have to start there. And then I'm, I'm nearly finished. So um, there were many quality programs, just like the Samaritan's Confidential 24 hour crisis response hotline um, and clinically based and government run programs um, and programs like Samaritan's that are not usually included in the city's approved referral networks. This legislation is a good step in assisting more people in crisis in getting the help they need. But to be really effective, we suggest you break down the silos, which I think is what Council Member Ayala was saying between NYPD, DOHMH, and all the other programs and expand the city's helping network. Thank you, Chair Ayala. I think you have the finger on the pulse and if we can be of help and all of us here, thank you. Thank you so much, Fiona, so nice to see you. Yeah, nice to see you too. Thank you very much. Our next panelist will be Erica Sandoval. Uh, and when you're unmuted and the sergeant cues you, you may begin. Your time starts now. Thank you. I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of Dr. Claire Green Ford and myself. Thank you. Thank you for allowing the National Association of Social Workers New York City chapter to present testimony regarding the city's mental health response to community violence and introduction 1890, which relates to required reporting of incidents of community violence and trauma and subsequent community outreach by DOHMH regarding access to mental health services for those impacted. My name is Erica Sandoval and I currently serve as the president for the National Association of Social Workers New York City chapter. This testimony is in collaboration with ED Executive Director, Dr. Claire Greenford, who could not be here today, and our board member and colleague, Kenton Kirby, who is the Director of Practice at the Center for Court Innovation. The National Association of Social Workers, New York City chapter represents over 5,000 social work members, and it has over 110,000 social workers across the country represented. We are honored to represent our profession for such an important and timely discussion today. Social workers are uniquely positioned and trained to address a wide range of biopsychosocial needs impacting individuals, families, and communities among many specialty and practice areas. Social workers are trained in advocacy, community organizing, and mental health. On any given day, social workers support thousands of individuals and families in addressing a myriad of needs, including trauma. We appreciate this opportunity to speak about the need for a comprehensive mental health response to address community violence and trauma. We would be remiss if we didn't begin by acknowledging and offering our heartfelt condolences to the many New Yorkers who have lost loved ones and have been profoundly impacted by personal trauma, community violence, racial trauma, and COVID-19. Historically, the field of mental health has played a vital role in responding to and supporting the healing process for survivors of harm. Individuals and families impacted by intimate partner violence, sexual assault, war, poverty, forced migration, homelessness, and other traumatic experiences have benefited from mental health treatment if they have been able to access programs offering these services. As social workers, we are charged by our professional code of ethics to uplift oppressed and marginalized communities. And so we ask, what about survivors of community violence who do not have an opportunity to access those services? What about those who live in communities where services are far and few and far in between? What happens to those children's parents and community members who experience compounded trauma as they grapple with the social, mental, economic, and personal impact of years of divestment and systemic oppression? Research shows that high levels of community violence are often associated with experience of divestment and inequality within communities. It also shows that lived experiences of community violence can often be traced to a need to survive while facing the realities of community pain, trauma, inadequate support and resources and poverty. Moreover, what happens to individuals who reside in neighborhoods that are over-policed and under-resourced? Those communities that have a justified mistrust of the helping profession. I'm 
I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of Dr. Claire as well. I apologize. Because that help typically comes with a condition. Two more minutes. Whether you're mandated to a program or otherwise must comply with services to avoid punitive sanctions. It's undeniable that people in living with communities most impacted by community violence and trauma are predominantly black, brown, and the indigenous people of color. It is also understandable that after years of systemic violence and limited support, many in these communities have a general mistrust of social services. Mistrust is a pro protective factor than when experience suggests that these systems don't make people feel safe or secure. There are far reaching implications for access to critical mental health services for New York City residents. 41% of adult New Yorkers living with serious mental health and illness report that they needed mental health services in the last year, but did not receive or delay treatment. Black, Latinx, and Asian American New York City residents are disproportionately less likely to be connected to the mental health care services they need. Despite the mistrust with sensitivity and care given to the experiences of communities impacted by violence, the mental health system is uniquely positioned to make an impact in the space of community violence. Depression, anxiety, PTSD have all been linked to exposure to community violence. And this pattern is most prevalent in communities already disproportionately affected by COVID-19. Throughout the city, some organizations are providing social, socio-emotional support to communities impacted by violence. The CMS system is uniquely positioned to support in this effort due to their proximity and credibil credibility in these communities, as well as their effectiveness, which is reflected in the numbers across CMS sites. Shooting victimations fell by 28% over the first 24 months after a site launched and gun injuries decreased by 33%. Programs led by community members enjoy public support and 68% of likely voter support funding programs to train community leaders to de-escalate potentially violent situations. Programs such as SOS, Life Camp, and Man Up are connecting with survivors who are otherwise not going to the Family Justice Center, for example. These projects are leading with the notion of providing support with no strings attached, and also work to engage and uplift those they serve in ways that go beyond traditional approaches, effectively addressing simultaneously public health crises of community violence, COVID-19, systemic racism requires an approach that is community oriented and community led. It requires that experts partner with and learn from impacted communities. It's necessities that trust is built between communities and helping professionals so that the appropriate and timely hands off to those who have the ability to provide in-depth mental health and trauma response services are made. Our value should be rooted in the notion that all people deserve support without being tethered to conditions or punishment. We must also look outside of the traditional talk therapy interventions in communities and include mentorship and convene peer support spaces, which can also provide healing for communities. We sincerely applaud the city council for taking steps to address the mental health needs of the individuals and communities. At the same time, we recognize the importance of addressing violence and harm through a lens that both acknowledges systemic racism and brings voice to the impact of racial and ethno-racial trauma. As such, we implore the council to respond to the needs of the community through a holistic and culturally humble lens that is built upon the foundation of collaboration trust and the importance of human relationships. The, NAS state, the NASW New York City chapter overwhelmingly supports efforts to address the mental health needs and trauma response services for New Yorkers. We stand ready to collaborate with these entities, City Council, NYPD, DOHMH, and community-based providers to ensure the care and well-being of our people struggling with mental health crisis. We are happy to assist in developing models of care educational resources grounded in our professional expertise in mental health, advocacy, community organizing, and cultural humility. Fortunately, there are examples of community organized interventions to look to and partner with in creating greater accessibility of mental health services. Thank you for this incredible opportunity to advocate for mental health services on behalf of the many individuals and families impacted by community violence and trauma. We leave you with the words of Lila Watson. Aboriginal educator and activist from Australia who stated, if you come to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you come because your liberation is bound upon with mine, then let us work together. We agree and believe that We Forward is built upon respect, collaboration, understanding, our interconnectedness and creating equitable and culturally humble access to mental health and trauma response services in New York City. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next panelist will be Joyce Kendrick, Brooklyn Defender Services. And you may begin once the Sergeant cues you. Your time starts now. My name is Joyce Kendrick and I am the attorney in charge of the mental health representation team of the criminal defense practice at Brooklyn Defender Services. Thank you, Chair Ayala and the Committee on Mental Health Disabilities and Addiction for holding this important hearing on the city's mental health response to community violence. The mental health representation team at BDS works to support people living with serious mental illness who have been accused of a crime in Brooklyn. Many of those we work with have experienced serious trauma that was the result of direct or indirect community violence. The global health emergency due to the COVID-19 pandemic has disproportionately affected the Black and Latinx communities in Brooklyn. In addition to community violence, many are also dealing with economic insecurity, the looming threat of eviction, and dealing with collective illness, loss, and grief. This chronic period of uncertainty has been linked to increased mental health concerns and stress in these communities. For these reasons, we commend the New York City Council for holding this timely hearing on the ways in which our city can address the mental health impact of community violence and trauma. BDS agrees with the council's determination that mental health resources must be provided in communities after a violent incident has occurred. And therefore we support the spirit of intro 1890. However, we believe that there are important components to this outreach that are missing from this bill. For this reason, in our written testimony, we have outlined several recommendations for increased access to mental health care, mobile crisis, and other resources in Black and Latinx communities. We strongly believe that community leaders and credible messengers must be involved in the planning and outreach. Because we also recognize that interactions with police and the criminal legal system can be traumatic for these communities, we believe that it is important for the city to ensure clear delineation between NYPD officers and DOHMH providers. The roles must be clearly communicated to community members since DOHMH will be conducting outreach at the same time as the NYPD conducts its criminal investigations. Finally, we believe that DOHMH must take steps to ensure the community that they will not share the confidential information of people accessing mental health care through this outreach initiative. We believe that a failure to do so will deter the use of the services. Thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer questions. Those are really good points, Joyce. Thank you so much. I look forward to reading the entire recommendation. Thank you very much to this panel. Uh, Chair Ayala, if you have, without further questions, we can go to the next panel. Our second panel will be Jihae Fisher, the Korean American Family Service Center, Ravi Reddy, Asian American Federation, and Hallie Yee from the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families. Um, just as before, when you hear your name, please give the host a moment to unmute you and you can begin your testimony once the sergeant cues you. Jihae Fisher, we'll begin with you as soon as you're unmuted and the host cues you. Your time starts now. I would like to thank the um, city, um, sorry, I, I would like to thank the city council and the, and the committee on mental health disabilities and addiction for the opportunity to testify. My name is Jiha Fisher and I'm the executive director of the Korean American Family Service Center, KAFSC. We provide social services to the immigrant survivors and their children who are affected by domestic violence, sexual assault, and child abuse. All our programs and services are offered in a culturally and linguistically appropriate setting. Domestic violence and sexual assault are prevalent crimes in the Korean Asian community that require a cultural and linguistically sensitive response, a fact which has been highlighted during the COVID-19 pandemic and economic shutdown. A study found that 60% of Korean women living in the U.S. has been battered. Similarly, a study from the Asian and Pacific Islander 
DV Resource Project found that an average of 51% of Asian women report experiencing physical and or sexual violence by an intimate partner during their lifetime. This is reproduced in child witnesses of violence who are 74 times more likely to commit violent crimes against another. Getting help is difficult for a shame-based culture barricaded by additional barriers of limited English proficiency and culturally negative views of outing crime or reaching out to the police. A major barrier for underserved immigrant victims is language and cultural barriers. Korean slash Asian immigrants have high levels of limited English proficiency on familiarity with U.S. systems due to immigration and isolating cultural views and responses, responses to violence. Additional barriers have appeared as a result of COVID-19, digital illiteracy, lack of internet access, and being forced to isolate with their abuser and unable to find a confidential place to receive counseling or call, call for help. Without the help, our victims and their children will continue to suffer from the traumatic incidents and will leave a lifelong scar and struggle, struggle to live a healthy life. Therefore, it is critical for KFSC to pr provide culturally competent community outreach and training which will prevent violence and decrease barriers in the Korean community. Our bilingual and bicultural frontline staff provide critical essential services to Korean victims of violence to identify crimes of domestic violence and sexual assault, educate about victims' rights, lessen fell cultural barriers to reporting violence, and access available resources. Previous um, um, opportunities allowed KFSC to conduct mass media campaigns through local Korean radio, reaching tens of thousands of, thousands of listeners across New York. Time expired. This, we are, this was especially effective during the COVID-19 pandemic, which victims were isolated. KFSC, KFSC shared information about resources, victim rights, public and health benefits, and more. We urgently ask the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction um, to take proactive measures to support the immigrant community and continue providing support, including um, public benefits um, and other um, safety uh, measures to ensure that our survivors and their children find hope to sustain them past this time of uncertainty and back on a road economically empowered and free from violence. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next panelist will be Ravi Reddy from the Asian American Foundation Federation. Ravi, as soon as you're queued, you may begin. Your time starts now. So I wanna thank committee chair Ayala and council members Cabrera, Van Bramer, Ambry Samuel and Borelli for holding this important hearing. My name is Ravi Reddy and I'm the Associate Director of Advocacy and Policy at the Asian American Federation. We're here to discuss with the committee a challenge that is specific to our community and the associated mental health response from our city, rising anti-Asian xenophobia and violence. One need only look at the almost daily coverage of anti-Asian violence, like the burning of an 89-year-old Asian woman in Brooklyn in July, or the assault of an Asian man in Chelsea last month for atrocious examples of xenophobia manifesting as community violence. And the impact of anti-Asian xenophobia has citywide implications. Since 2000, the Asian population in New York City increased by 51% to over 1.3 million in 2019, or 16% of our city's total population. The city's Commission on Human Rights collected more than 100 bias incident reports against Asian Americans just between February and May, while AAF tracked 371 such complaints through its own reporting portal and the Stop AAPI hate platform in the first half of this year. But systemic factors like high poverty, high limited English, limited English proficiency, and lack of immigration status lends themselves to significant underreporting. A recent survey we conducted of Asian small business owners showed that over 60% of respondents said they were worried about the safety of themselves, their staff, and their business establishments. And while 40% of Asian seniors reported experiencing depression and Asian women ages 65 and older had the highest suicide rate across all demographics, community violence is yet another layer to the mental health challenges facing our most vulnerable. 
So we're coming to this conversation well aware that mental health service delivery in the most diverse community and city is difficult, but our member and partner agencies are leading the way in innovating service delivery so that we can get our community's mental health challenges addressed while respecting the necessity for cultural competency and navigating entrenched cultural stigma. It's due in large part to our advocacy efforts and that of the community that the city has responded the way in the ways they have, such as the city coordinating resources to respond to hate crimes and working with us on creating a reporting tool on seven Asian languages and safety resources to keep our community members safe. But there is still plenty of work that needs to be done. Nonetheless, Asian-led, Asian-serving organizations continue to struggle to receive the funding they need to provide serv services the way our community members best receive them. From fiscal year 2002 to 2014, Asian Americans' share of DOHMH funding was 0.2% of total contract dollars and 1.6% of the total number of contracts. This was over a 12-year period, and this represents a trend. So here are recommendations. We want to recognize Committee Chair Ayala's effort in addressing community violence with the introduction of Bill 1890. This work is personal for our community as well. This bill surfaces a, few, a key concern, though. Very few Asian agencies are funded by DOHMH, which means there are few culturally competent providers who are in DOHMH's network to be able to respond to reports of violent incidents against Asian New Yorkers. I just have a couple more recommendations. And to this end, the city should invest in and prioritize Asian-led, Asian-serving community-based organizations that are already doing crisis management and trauma support, enabling them to hire culturally competent mental health providers, create community education programs to introduce the concept of mental health in a linguistically and culturally competent manner, and train mainstream mental health providers to develop their cultural competency. Bill 1890 should also spur a broader conversation on reporting and the need for greater language and process access when it comes to reporting traumatic incidents, especially when law enforcement is involved. Legislation that is contingent on reporting of such incidents is only as powerful and effective as the community's competence in and access to reporting systems. So on behalf of the AF, I want to thank you for letting us speak with you about COVID-19's impact on our community and how we can move forward together to address broader issues of community violence. This work is critical, these conversations are critical, and the Asian American Federation looks forward to working with all of you in making sure that New Yorkers are safe and secure in their own city. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, Ravi, does your organization, um, so when there's a, a victim of an assault, assault um, do they norm, do you guys, does, the, does, does your organization then follow up with the mental health um, needs of those individuals or is there, is that a service that's being provided by the NYPD as was uh, alluded to earlier in the so actually a number of our service providers, so we're an advocacy organization working on behalf of 70 grassroots organizations, many of whom actually do this work on the ground. Um, so I can get you a better idea of how they're individually following up on these individual cases. Um, that doesn't necessarily fall within our purview of work though. Um, many of our service providers like KAFSC, uh, um, Jihei Fisher is leading that organization. Um, a lot of these organizations are addressing those on the ground though. I can get a better. I can get a better answer for you and a follow up. Yeah, I, I, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much. Our next panelist will be Hallie Yi, Coalition for Asian American Children and Families. And Hallie, when the sergeant cues you, you may begin. Your time starts now. Good morning. My name is Hallie Yi, and I'm policy coordinator at Coalition for Asian American Children and Families. Um, since 1986, CACF has been the nation's only Pan-Asian children and families advocacy organization that leads the fight for improved and equitable policy systems, funding, and services to support those in need. On behalf of our 40 plus organizational partners and members, we have consistently been asking city council to hold our public health systems accountable to our community needs through key, three key steps. Um, first, providing accurate data collection and disaggregation of that data from everything from infection rates, hospitalizations, deaths, to um, community violence in our APA communities. Second, um, that the city's health system can ensure that critical information gets to families in the languages that they need. And third, that the city address the mental health needs of children and families, especially those who are East Asian presenting who have been targeted during this pandemic. Of these, we will of course be focusing on the latter today as there needs to be a system in place that can be prepared to help our communities who have faced loss, isolation, discrimination, xenophobia, and more 
as they return to daily life. This pandemic has fostered an environment of fear and uncertainty that are resulting in targeted acts of racism towards APAs. In New York, specifically East Asian presenting individuals have been subjected to violent racist attacks and xenophobic representations of the virus in the media. The city needs to ensure support of targeted communities of color during the crisis moving forward. We all know that communities of color and immigrant communities are often scapegoated in times of crisis for the APA community due to the stigmatizing nature of the virus compounded by the anti-Asian racism. This means that individuals are less likely to seek treatment and when they do, they may be afraid to even identify as Asian, potentially leading to negative health outcomes and an underrepresentation of the pandemic's impact on our community. We demand an investment in community-led efforts towards data collection on incidents, inter-community healing, and positive mental health. Mental health has not been a key concern in the city's COVID response, despite the fact that this has been and is continuing to be a time of deep collective trauma. Our communities are consistently overlooked in the distribution of resources, which is harmful to us as well as other communities of color who are denied the same resources due to perceived success of APAs. This pandemic has highlighted a myriad of holes in our city's safety net systems, and the city's address, response must address root problems in addition to immediate needs. Our community will continue to suffer every day that we allow these flaws to exist in the system. And similarly to as Ravi had stated, because of that, our um, community organizations are the ones who end up having to do a lot of the work for in-language resources, as well as mental health services, and yet are not being seen by the city in terms of funding and um, contracts. As always, CACF will continue to be available as a resource and partner to address these concerns and look forward to working with you to better address our community needs. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you to this entire panel. Our next panel will be Susan Dan from Project Renewal and Michael Pollenberg from Safe Horizon. Susan, you can begin as soon as the host unmutes you and the sergeant cues you. Thank you. Your time starts now. Good afternoon, Chair Ayala and City Council members. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify briefly about the value of trauma-informed services. My name is Susan Dan, and I'm the Senior Vice President of Programs at Project Renewal, a New York City homeless services nonprofit agency. For more than 53 years, Project Renewal has empowered individuals and families who are experiencing homelessness to renew their lives. Each year, Project Renewal serves nearly 15,000 New Yorkers through our wraparound services focused on health, homes, and jobs. We are grateful to Chair Ayala, the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and the City Council for their support of Project Renewal services, especially our pioneering mental health services. I'd like to tell you about um, Project Renewal Support and Connection Center in East Harlem today, which we opened in February, closed temporarily when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, and reopened in late October. Funded by DOHMH, the Support and Connection Center is one of the city's two new diversion centers based on a proven model of trauma-informed engagement for people in distress. This was recommended by the 2015 Mayoral Task Force on Behavioral Health and the Criminal Justice System. We operate the center in partnership with DOHMH and the NYPD. Our center serves New Yorkers who are on the cusp of a mental health crisis and have attracted police attention. People who would otherwise be issued a summons or escorted to an emergency room only to be released without receiving the services they need to recover and maintain stability. We have a strong partnership with NYPD's 25th Precinct, which identifies and refers guests who can most benefit from our services. The center provides police with a place where they can bring guests before their situations or behaviors escalate out of control. Currently, we serve up to 10 overnight guests and an, and an additional 10 guests for daytime services. Overnight guests can stay for up to five nights, but are always welcome to return for daytime services. Guests have access to medically supervised substance use withdrawal services, counseling, short-term case management, and links to ongoing behavioral health and social services, giving them a path to long-term stability. The center is staffed by a team of social workers, certified alcoholism and substance use counselors, nurses, psychiatrists, and peer support workers who have lived experience with mental health or substance use issues. These peers are crucial in modeling success and encouraging our guests to let their guard down and consider changing their lives. In the brief span that the center has been open, we've been able to provide meaningful support to New Yorkers like DW, our first ever guest. 
Um, DW is a 61 year old African American woman with a history of homelessness and substance use. When NYPD brought her to the center, she appeared to be under the influence, emotionally distressed and exhausted. Our peer support workers and substance use counselors engaged her immediately. We offered her, to, uh, we offered her a safe place to rest, meals when she wanted them and staff available to talk when she was ready. Over the course of multiple conversations, DW completed a psychiatric evaluation and I'm psychosocial inspired. assessment. She was also escorted to her outpatient drug, um, drug treatment program daily. We connected her with Arms Acres in upstate New York, but on the evening before she was scheduled to be admitted, she left the center. She actually returned on her own four days later and we picked up right where we left off, successfully connecting her to Arms Acres for residential rehabilitation. DW acknowledged that she felt ashamed when she returned to the center, but that staff continued to make her feel welcomed and did not judge her. Ultimately, our goal is to help clients begin a path to long-term stability that will position them to be more positive members of the community. Changing long-term uh, long patterns of behavior requires time, but we believe that the center's model of, uh, model of engagement will help clients feel empowered to make changes, which is critical to achieving long-lasting positive outcomes. The Support and Connection Center um, model is one way to support people in crisis, and we at Project, uh, we at Project Renewal believe in multiple strategies. That's why intro 1890 is so critical. Project Renewal supports this legislation as it seeks to strengthen the connection between the NYPD, DOHMH, and community resources in the aftermath of violent incidents, when community outreach and resources are most crucial. Formalizing this mechanism can provide additional resources and connect the people who have been impacted by a violent incident to services that can prevent long-term mental health issues, as well as possibly preventing retaliatory violence. Thank you once again for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much. Our next and final panelist will be Michael Pollenberg from Safe Horizon. I just wanna take a minute in case we inadvertently missed any of the panelists, please use the raise hand function on Zoom and we'll call on you afterward. Um, Michael Pollenberg, you may begin after the Sergeant cues you. Thank you. Time starts now. Thank you so much uh, and uh, good afternoon. Now, my name is Michael Pollenberg. I'm the Vice President of Government Affairs at Safe Horizon, the nation's largest nonprofit provider of services to victims of violence and abuse. This morning, I'll briefly discuss Safe Horizon's Crime Victim Assistance Program, which you heard about earlier today, uh, otherwise known as CBAP, which is a cornerstone of New York City's efforts to improve its response to victims of crime and which last year provided services to 50,000 New Yorkers. I will also briefly discuss our Families of Homicide Victims Program and how we help families cope with traumatic loss. We believe that both of these programs are in line with the committee's wishes to, to provide a more robust mental health response to communities impacted by violent crime. At its heart, CVAP is about providing a client-centered, trauma-informed response to New Yorkers as quickly as possible after they report a crime. Through CVAP, Safe Horizon advocates in every precinct and police service area can quickly connect with individuals and families and address their safety concerns in a way that addresses their heightened feelings of trauma and fear. Understanding the important role that mental health practitioners can play in the aftermath of a crime, Safe Horizon refers CVAP clients to our own licensed mental health clinic, as well as those operated by our colleagues at the Crime Victim Treatment Center and other service providers around the city. An important part of our role is also linking crime victims to community-based organizations like VIP and other providers who pro offer a more culturally specific response. CVAP advocates provide supportive counseling, connections to individual and group therapy, and help navigating the legal and financial challenges that can emerge after a crime has occurred. Advocates follow up with victims who file police reports and those who walk into a precinct seeking help and assist them in identifying safety concerns and developing a safety plan that meets their needs. We're proud of our work and of the high client satisfaction rates that we consistently achieve. Approximately 90% of the program's 50,000 clients last year reported feeling better as a result of our outreach and knew where to turn for help, including for mental health assistance. I also wanna briefly mention the role Safe Horizon plays in reaching out to family members who've lost a lost one to homicide. We've been doing this important work for decades and have helped provide solace, counseling and tangible assistance to families as they process unimaginable loss and grief. We know that this loss affects not just the impacted family but entire communities whose sense of safety and order can be in doubt. 
Our Families of Homicide Victims Program helps families apply for funds for burial costs. We accompany families to uh, court proceedings. We advocate on their behalf with the medical examiner's office, the district attorney's office, and the police department. And we help victims connect to counseling and others who can share and help them manage their grief. We know every path to healing looks different and we stay with families as long as they need us. As the council considers how best to bolster the mental health response to communities impacted by violent crime, I hope our work in this space can help inform this process. Thank you for your concerns and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much to this entire panel. Uh, and I'll now turn back to Chair Ayala for any closing remarks and to close out the hearing. Um, so I just thank you, Michael. Um, that was really that was really helpful, and I, I and I appreciate the acknowledgement that you know uh, traumatic traumatic um, you know violence doesn't just impact the family, right? I mean, violence in general. I mean, it affects the entire community at large, and so we're just really just trying to figure out what what the best approach is, right? And what systems we can create um, collectively that allow us to do that in a more seamless uh, you know, way so that we're not really relying on an individual to pick up the phone, we, you know, it becomes an automatic response. Um, and so I appreciate you all coming to testify and I look forward to uh, reading uh, the uh, submitted testimonies for recommendations and we will uh, reconvene, I guess we will look at the bill a little bit more closely and see uh, what, you know, ways that we can strengthen it based on what we've heard today. So thank you all and have a good holiday. Thank you. This meeting is complete.